talk about today is excavation, commercial excavation, um, funded by MacLeod in Argyll at Upper Largy Quarry, which is in the Carmarthen Glen. Um, <coughs> and this image shows, oh, this is, no. oh sorry. So this is the um, current quarry here, and we've now extended into this field here. Um, just a bit of background for you. Um, the quarry's been excavated probably from the 1980s onwards, um, with quite a lot of work happening um, in this area in here in late 1990s, early 2000s. And basically, to sum it up, what was found was a um, Neolithic cursus. This is this monument here. Um, this is a, a, a timber-built, post-built cursus. And then on top of it, um, in this area here, is a Bronze Age timber circle. There's an avenue that leading up to the um, monument here. It's got a very dodgy date associated with it, so we don't really know the period of that. And then in here, which is significant, and it's um, come apparent later on, um, was a large pit, possibly a burial, um, from which three beakers, sort of Copper Age um, date, three beakers came from, which Alison thinks may be related to the Netherlands. Um, and then in more recently, last few years, I did an archaeological evaluation. You can see all the evaluation trenches in because basically they needed to extend the quarry. And um, up in this corner here, we've got very strange sort of almost like drainage features, possibly a burial cairn, another possible burial cairn here. Um, and then um, you can see the cursors. We found the cursors running up through the site um, and quite a lot of um, negative features found in, in this area. Um, so we also evaluated this field to see whether there was less archaeology and it would be better for them to extend the quarry to that side, which um, it appeared to be. We've got a buried soil here, which again we'll talk about later, and then a sort of cluster of archaeology up in the north area there. So these are phase one and phase two have now been um, fully topsoil stripped and excavated. And basically within that, those two areas, we've got um, features dating from the Mesolithic right through to the medieval period. Um, and I think one nice thing that this um, project so far has shown is we've got quite a lot of radiocarbon dates um, from the site and it's proved um, it's worthwhile doing because lots of individual features date from different periods which if we'd only dated a, got a couple of dates we would have never realised the um, complexity of the site. So I'm just going to talk about the um, very briefly about the Neolithic is this area in here um, this is basically a in situ buried soil, which you can see they're being excavated and you can see evidence of nice argyle weather there. Um, and this is, um, comprises lots of charcoal, a few lithics and a huge amount of pottery, which again, Alison and, and Mike will be talking about in greater detail in a minute. Um, the potential for the site is sadly, you know, that's all we found in this area. You can see the higher ground up at the top there. Cloud truncation has been enormous at Upper Largy, so there's, there's actually very little archaeological material remaining, certainly in this field. So that's Neolithic done. Um, I'm then going to just mention now, um, up in here, this, up in this main area of excavation area, um, this is a feature I'm going to talk about in here. Um, this is um, dates to the Copper Age, so it's sort of um, late Neolithic, early Bronze Age. And it was quite strange excavating it. it, felt almost medieval when excavating it. It's basically a stone lined pit. Um, and to all intents and purposes, very much like a kiln. Um, Charcoal is dominated by oak with a little few other species, but majority is oak, no carbonized grains, and nothing else in it. Um, and I was just chatting to Mike earlier on, he was saying it may be used for, for firing pots in. We didn't get any remains of pots in it though. Um, so that remains a bit of a mystery, but it's the exactly same date as that um, pit with the three beaker um, beakers came from. So, you know, obviously there's, there's more than one activity happening on this site during this period. Okay, and we're gonna rush now through to the Iron Age and look at this structure here. You can see that's a, basically a four poster structure. Again, um, massive plow truncation. Um, so we've just got the base of these, what are four post holes. They're being packed um, with stone and they've got charcoal fills in the centre, um, which is full of carbonised cereal grain, um, 
including barley, emma, and quite a few oats. And it's third, fourth century um, BC, so it's unusual to have so many oats in, in our RNA structure. Um, presumably some kind of grain store. Um, okay, and then we're going whizzing now through the periods, just to the sort of later Iron Age, and looking at this structure here. And there it is being excavated. So in the foreground, you've got the... Um, this is the um, Copper Age kiln, and then this is this, um, this is first, second century BC feature in here. And we've got um, at least 23 fragments of crucible from this, and including also a piece of, um, just down here in this corner, um, fragment of a mould. And um, Gemma from the National Museum of Scotland has done some XRF analysis on it, and it's been shown that um, basically it was for... Um, melting bronze in it, and so for bronze casting. And what's interesting about this little assemblage is that there, there are no conjoining pieces. So they're almost like 23 different fragments from 23 different crucibles. Um, and some of them have been reused and some of them haven't. So it's almost like the, the fragments have been cached and then deliberately deposited as a wanna in this pit. And also unusually, um, normally Iron Age um, metalworking happens, takes place on settlement sites. And again, we've got no evidence, well, apart from a couple of hundred years earlier, that four-poster structure of Iron Age settlement actually up uh, at Abalagi at the moment. We may find that further to the north when we excavate further to the north. But at the moment, it's quite an unusual site, so, um, and it's nicely dated, so they're quite excited about that. Um, then, um, basically, just as a last little bit, just to introduce you to the complexity of the site, um, we've got this structure up at the top here, curving round. Um, and as well as sort of 9th, 10th century pits over the site, we've also got then this structure here. You can see it here quite nicely. It would have been some kind of organic walling, um, groove walling in um, that structure in this area. Get my mouse again. Probably an entrance port, quite a lot of post holes. Um, and that dates, this structure dates to the 14th century. So it's, it's medieval. Um, so you can see just through that real whiz through of the different types of archaeology. Without all that dating that we did, I don't think we'd have understood the complexity of the site. We've got very few finds from the site. So it just proves, you know, the, 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 the use of using lots of radio calm dates. But I'm now going to hand over to Alison, who's going to talk about the... Eight minutes. <laughs> Right, back to the Neolithic. Thanks, Claire. I'm going to focus on this area on the western edge of the site, where a thin layer of charcoal-rich midnight material, 18 by 5 metres, was excavated and was found to contain around 900 sherds of grooved ware, weighing over 7.5 kilos. These turned out to belong to a massive total of 237 pots, making this the largest assemblage of grooved ware pottery yet found on mainland Scotland by a long chalk. What we're dealing with, as you can see here, is small parts of a lot of pots. They were highly fragmented, and there were examples of sherds from the same pots being found several metres from each other. It could be that the pots all relate to a single event, perhaps a feast. What we can't say for sure is whether this activity was related to the timber uh, avenue that Claire mentioned, which is about 200 metres away to the southeast, but it's a possibility. It's a pure grooved ware assemblage with no other type of pottery present. It's all flat-based, and with the exception of these three tiny pots on the left, the assemblage consists of three basic categories of pot, all of them either tub-shaped with vertical walls or bucket-shaped with splaying walls. And the first of these is these small to medium-sized fineware bowls, which range from around 150 to 220 millimetres, so they're about sort of yay big. They tend to have fairly dense decoration, covering much or all of the exterior and also very often on the interior as well. Second category, larger fineware jars, around 200 to 300 millimetres in rim diameter. Uh, diameter. These may have less, less dense decoration, but again, the decoration is on the interior as well as the exterior in a lot of cases. Third is these large, thick-walled courseware jars, the biggest of which has an estima estimated base diameter of 410 millimetres. That's a sizable pot. These had usually been coated with a slip to help hide any inclusions that might be poking through the surface. Fabric-wise, again, magic three categories. First, contains only sparse fragments of stone, varying in size between the pots. Quite a few of the fineware bowls are of this fabric. And the types of stone that are present are likely to have been locally available. Second, features the use of crushed quartz or quartzite in varying amounts, but often the fragments are fairly sizable. 
This is found in all three types of pot and the rock is abundantly available locally. The third type is vesicular to a greater or lesser degree, a bit like a Swiss cheese, and it's clear that these sockets aren't from the burning out of an organic filler, but instead the result of the dissolution of this yellow, rotten stone that could be a local phyllite, a sandy limestone. Again, this is found in all three types of pot, with the fineware bowls tending to have smaller and fewer holes. And there's also a couple of pots that seem to have grog in. Decoration-wise, it's clear that incision is the dominant technique. And it's mostly used to create designs featuring bands of horizontal lines interspersed with bands of zigzag or serpentine lines. Sometimes, some of these lines have a ladder pattern. Incision is also used to create a vertical crisscross design, seeing on the bigger, bigger pots. Impression also features, including these deep hollows and these other hollows that have been used to slash a cordon here, as well as finer jabs, um, here used to create a kind of knot motif where lines join, and here to fill in an area. Very unusually for grooved wear, there are a few examples of where whipped cord had been used to make the impressions. And there's also a few examples of accidental impressions made when an unfired pot had been laid onto a mat to dry. Some pots have applied and or moulded decoration, usually in the form of cordons, and most commonly these occur as plain horizontal lines or as, well, or as horizontal plus sloping lines, zigzag lines. Narrow cordons like this tend to occur on the fineware jars, whereas bigger, chunky cordons are on the courseware jars. And in a couple of cases, it's possible to see how these cordons were fitted onto the pot using a kind of mortise and tenon arrangement. And yes, I know this looks kind of like a, a grooved wear emoji face, but it's a happy pot. And this way of fixing on cordons was first spotted by Roy Towers at the Ness of Brogdor assemblage on Orkney. One of the most interesting pots in the whole assemblage is this large jar that is applied narrow cordons arranged as nested lozenges. We'll come back to this motif in a moment. Other kinds of applied decoration have been used to create a ledge on the inside of a rim, perhaps for a seating for a lid. And there's one example of where an oval pellet had been stuck on and then scored down. And this rim also has notches made by impressed whipped cord on the top. And while we're on rims, there are also two pots with undulating so-called pie crust rims. As for the pot's functions, quite a few of the fineware and courseware jars have burnt on encrustation on their inner and sometimes outer surfaces, showing that they've been used for cooking. And lipid analysis um, confirms this, showing traces of ruminant dairy fat, indicating the former presence of milk, butter or cheese. Several pots are scorched from sitting on or in a fire, and there are also quite a few completely thoroughly burnt sherds, again, probably from sitting around in a fire. But the organic residues on the fineware pots are very interesting because they seem slightly different. They're thin, very often they're shiny, and I suspect that this doesn't derive from burning on during cooking, but that this is the evaporated remains of some kind of liquid contents. One of these pots was subjected to lipid analysis, but nothing was found. These bowls were probably serving bowls for food and drink. The upper lagi assemblage is hugely important in several respects, not just its size. Firstly, it's well dated. Two radiocarbon dates have been obtained directly from organic residues, and these join the three from short-lived charcoal to show that this assemblage dates to between 2900 and 2650 BC, probably closer to around 2900 end of things. Secondly, it's of early grooved ware style that can be matched in Orkney, where grooved ware was invented. The later phases of activity at Barn House, for example, provide several close and specific parallels. And as Mike will tell you, it can also be matched among early grooved ware assemblages elsewhere in Scotland, most notably at Balfarg Riding School in Fife. And parallels can also be found further afield in England and Ireland. Thirdly, grooved ware finds of any kind are incredibly rare in the west of Scotland. And they tend to be associated with timber or stone circles, as at Callanish on Lewis or Machimor on Arran. And let's not forget that down in Kilmartin Glen, below Upper Lagi, uh, there are the timber and stone circles at Tem Tem uh, Temple Wood. So this map shows a southwesterly spread from Orkney, not only of the use of grooved ware, but also of the use of circles. People from Kilmartin Glen could have sailed up to Orkney for the winter solstice celebrations there and brought back the idea of making grooved ware and building circles. And remember that nested lozenge design on the pot? Well, we can see it on other grooved ware from elsewhere, including Cumbria, and also, importantly, 
on two stones found in Kilmartin Glen that were reused during the early Bronze Age. And the lozenge motif also features prominently in Irish passage tomb art in the Boyne Valley and elsewhere, as you can see here. And it may well be that its use on grooved ware and on stones in Kilmartin Glen is a deliberate reference to Irish passage tomb art. Eight minutes. <laughs> do my best. <laughs> this is cool, isn't it? I feel like a steampunk vicar. Um, right, anyway. Uh, hi, I'm, um, I'm Mike Hopper. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the, uh, the University of Bradford, and um, I'm currently uh, coordinating a project called um, Tracing the Lines, funded by Historic Environment Scotland, um, which aims to build on work that's been done recently by uh, a project run by Alistair Whittle uh, called Times of Their Lives, very what a Europe-wide project that's refined the dating of grooveware and the emergence of grooveware in Orkney. And uh, my project aims to see what happens outside of Orkney once grooveware begins to spread. Um, it's, it's addressing, as I say, the nature and spread of grooved wear beyond Orkney through the provision of a series of targeted radiocarbon dates, which are primarily going to be on organic residues, as these are more likely to date the, uh, the actual use of the pot rather than its context of deposition. There's going to be a few public engagement events associated with this, one of which I'll tell you about in a little while. Um, the project's producing a database of Scottish grooved wear sites as well, which will be online and available to everybody. And uh, there will be a series of reports in academic Academic and popular publications over the next year or so. Um, as Alison says, they, uh, we, we, we've got this spread of groove where not just down the west coast, which is principally what Alison was concentrating on, but also down the east coast of Scotland and, uh, and, and then down into Ireland and England and Wales, but not across to the continent. Uh, There's a whole series of different contexts, but we've got at least a hundred uh, um, uh, hundred grooved wear sites outside of Orkney in Scotland, although the definition of, of uh, an individual site can be a little bit tricky. We've got at least 90 good quality radiocarbon dates, uh, either indirectly or directly associated with groove wear pottery. And we've got a whole range of different contexts that it appears in. Pits, for example, a series of pits here at, um, in Aberdeenshire at Kintore and Mid Mill. We've got uh, timber and stone circles, as Alison's mentioned. Perhaps some of the best known being the, uh, the timber circle at uh, Balfarg, stone circles at Balburnie and Callanish there, but there's plenty more that you could choose from. Palisaded enclosures, a little bit later in date, perhaps, than the very earliest groove wear. Um, they're a good example down there at Dunraggett, um, and there, there are other recently excavated ones, um, uh, Led Ketty up in uh, Perthshire as well, which you'll probably hear a little bit about later, I'm sure. Um, we've got chambered cairns, not so much groove wear in chambered cairns, interestingly enough, but it does occur. Unival there on North Uist, uh, Tormor and Aran is another example. We've got settlement sites. Um, one there on, on um, South Eurstead and Doylin, but there are other ones as well. And other um, contexts of deposition uh, at Euford West, um, Grooveware was found in a pit next to a, a, an old long barrow. We've got um, what Richard Bradley called uh, maritime haven sites, coastal sand dunes, loose sands, for example, and, and other odd little places like strange pitfall trap at my plantation, which had a piece of grooveware in the bottom of a hole lined with stakes, seemingly. Um, and the way our understanding of, of the dates of grooveware um, pans out at the moment, we find incipient grooveware, developing grooveware, only in Orkney. Um, and by the time we're getting to about 3100 BC, we've got what we call classic groove wear in place at sites such as Barnhouse and, and the Ness of Brodga. Um, we've then got a spread down the east coast of, of Scotland and into northeastern England at a very early date, um, probably around about 3000 BC. There's some possible pre-3000 pre BC dates um, from um, places like Aberdeenshire, Invernessshire and down into Yorkshire and in England as well. Um, and round about the same time, we've got the, uh, uh, the movement of grooveware down in uh, the, the west coast of Scotland as well. Um, and we've got possible developments appearing uh, at this time as well. Um, just move through this fairly quickly. So we've got a, a style called the Durrington Wall style. We've got types of grooveware with vertical cordons, which I'll mention in just a moment. The end of groove wear is quite tricky to date, but it's probably coincidental with the first appearance of beaker pottery shortly after 2500 BC. Whether there were areas where groove wear continued in use a little bit later than that, um, it, it's something that I hope my project will try and illuminate a little bit. 
So Alison's already mentioned the uh, links between the designs we find on Grooveware and uh, um, in, in places like, well, she's, she's mentioned Kilmartin, but you, we could take it almost anywhere in Scotland, and some of the Orcadian sites, and here's good examples of incised, this, this sort of lattice motif that we get here. Um, and this uh, strange little false relief wavy line at the bottom, which is found at Barnhouse up in Orkney at a, 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 an early date. Possibly all the dates I've seen for that particular form are predated 2900 BC. Um, over on the west, very similar. Again, I've put an example from the nest of Brogger in Orkney down in the bottom right hand corner. Um, but there are possibly some regional differences here too. Groove has been divided up into a series of substyles in the past. Whether these apply really well in Scotland is, is debatable. But um, perhaps we could think of these as rather like uh, dialects, where we won't expect the words to be necessarily confined to one area, but we will expect perhaps to see general tendencies. And this, this dotty infill seems to be more common in the West, although it's certainly not absent in the East. Um, I did mention that this is an evolving tradition. We've got very early dates for these vertically cordoned vessels that some people think are skewer morphs, that, that is, um, examples of, um, in, in one fabric of, of uh, something that would have been realised more normally in another fabric, so in this case perhaps basketry in ceramic form, um, one from about 3000 BC at Midmill there. But, uh, but within a couple of hundred years we've got what's called the Durrington Wall style of groove named after the famous site down in Wessex, um, and this is associated with some of the big palisaded enclosures as well. So groove isn't a tradition that's standing still, and it may be that there's a regional component to this with ideas uh, arising in some regions and then spreading to others. I mentioned the very end of Grooveware. It is very tricky to date. It could be that Grooveware continued in use in some areas when it was, had more or less gone out of use in other areas. So we've got the Nessa Brogger over on the right there. Orkney may be hanging on to Grooveware and Grooveware related practices longer than some other areas. We know that there was a, a significant number of people moving into Britain at about the time that Grooveware went out of use, bringing beaker ideas with them and tying Britain in with the continent. So it could be that there's gonna be some kind of link between these two events. In fact, I'd be amazed if there wasn't really. Um, I don't know how long that's taken me. I've gone through as quick as I can. It is a very brief resume. But I did mention that there were some public engagement events associated with this project. And if any of you are in Orkney um, this summer and you don't want a quick eight minute presentation, then please do go along and have a look at. Oh, have I not got the last slide? Oh, that's a pity. Don't know where that's gone. There should be one more slide on that. Ah, oh, maybe I didn't put it on. Never mind. There is, um, uh, there is a groupware exhibition at the Orkney Museum in Kirkwall. It's free. It's open every day except for uh, Sundays, I think, which is odd for a museum. But um, please do come along if you're in that part of the world. OK, thank you. Thank you.